Okay, so happy to have Peter Golenbeck, New York Times bestseller, 10 times. Uh, you also have a couple of new books out in release, Whispers of the Gods and Valentine's Way. Peter, how are you doing this morning? I'm doing just great. Thanks, Andy. So we got to dive into that book, Whispers of the Gods. You have so many big time names and stories from people like Ted Williams, Stan Musial, Roy Campanella. Where were you able to collect all these stories and what gave you the inspiration to write this new book? Well, I've been, I've, my first book was Dynasty, which I got a contract for Dynasty in 1972. And it took me three years to write. I spent four years at Yankee Stadium doing research where I went through the archives. And after putting this together, I determined you can't write a book on newspaper articles. So I then spent the next two and a half years traveling the country and interviewing all of the Yankees from the years 1949 to 64, 16 years, 14 pennants, nine world championships. And so that was the first of my oral histories. And then I did Bums about the Brooklyn Dodgers Wrigleyville about the Chicago Cubs. Spirit of St. Louis was about the St. Louis Cardinals and the St. Louis Browns and Amazing, which is about the New York Mets. So I've had, I probably have 250 of these cassette taped interviews in my collection. So about three years ago, uh, Jim Bowden, who I was very close to, we used to live about three blocks apart when I lived in Englewood, New Jersey. And we were, we were teammates on the CBS All-Star team. We used to race our cars on the streets. He always won. Um, we played catch a lot. I babysat his kids. Uh, about three years ago, as I said, he got dementia and last year he died. And I thought that what I wanted to do was to sort of keep his memory alive. So I would make a book of players who I interviewed over the years. He would be the first chapter. He, he talked about how this kid from New Jersey somehow became a world champion with the Yankees and a star. And the last chapter was about his book, Ball Four, and how it came to be written and what happened to him after it was written. And the, the, you know, the world came down on his head from the commissioner and Mickey Mantle and Hank Aaron and so forth and so on. So to fill out the book, he was going to be chapters one and 17. I went and I got um, some of my favorite interviews from over the years. And so Ted Williams, one day, I'm sitting here working and I got a call. Going back. It's Ted. <laughs> so it was Ted Williams. He says, come over to the house. I want to talk to you about Joe Jackson. So I live in St. Petersburg. He lives in Ocala. So I got in my car and I drove to see Ted. And sure enough, he spent the next oh, hour and a half or so telling me why Joe Jackson belonged in the Hall of Fame. It was, it was wonderful, actually. Um, so I included that, the story. Stan Musley, I interviewed. I wanted uh, a great deal about Jackie Robinson, of course. Of course. So Roy Campanella is in this book. Uh, he had uh, a teammate, Rex Barney. Uh, Rex Barney was the one who told me how in Philadelphia and in Cincinnati, the white fans were booing Robinson mm. and um, uh, Pee Wee, who was from Louisville, Kentucky, a southerner, walked across the diamond and put his arms around Jackie's shoulders. And that became my children's book teammates, in fact. Um, Plus, you know, uh, I, I did the last interview with Roger Maris before he died. So I wanted to put Roger's interview in there. Um, Monty Irvin, who I was close to, uh, had a wonderful interview with him. Monty, uh, we, we had a, a, a sort of a, a panel of speakers here in St. Petersburg and he and I were both on the panel. So I, I drove to his home in the middle of the state and picked him up and drove him back here. And in the interim, I asked him if I could interview him. And he said, of course. And during that interview, he was telling me how during World War II, he was in the army and he was treated so miserably by the white 
officers, the mm. Southern white officers who just treated him terribly. And when he got home, he got a call from Branch Rickey asking him to be the first African-American to break the color line. And he told Ricky that I'm still shaking from how I was treated during the war and I can't possibly do that. Mm. And I'll give you a call in a couple of years when I can, you know, get my act together. And so Jackie, Jackie, of course, he was the first. And about two years later, Monty called Ricky to say, okay, now I can play. But Effa Manley, who was the owner of the Newark team that, uh, Monty played on wanted $10,000 and Ricky being the cheap guy that he was wouldn't pay it. <laughs> and so Monty ended up, you know, the, the uh, Aristonum of the Giants paid F of Manley the 10,000 and Monty Irvin ended up taking the New York Giants to pennants and world championships in well, pennant anyway, in 1951 and a world championship in 1954. Wow. So contract negotiations, that's something that's never changed in major league baseball. That's right. <laughs> now, one of the books that I really want to dive into is your How to Win at Rotisserie Baseball, The okay. Strategic Guide to America's New National Armchair Pastime. We just had an episode where we talked a lot about fantasy baseball, and I thought, wow, if we could get the guy that wrote the book, how wonderful would that be? So once again, glad to have you. What gave you the inspiration to dive into fantasy baseball? Was it a demand thing? Did people want to get into it? Where did that come from? I am in the oldest American League fantasy league in the country, the American Dreams League. And I was invited into it in 1983. It started, I think, in 81. Uh, and I have been involved in it ever since. So tell me how many years ago it was. 1983 that's got to be about 40 years i would say so i've been doing this for 40 years i have to tell you in all honesty my team has won twice in 40 years so th there are there are others primarily the people i interviewed for that book that book was written about 1990 which was before the computer became the rage that it has become so in it it gave the prices of the players for the next year and that's why it was so popular. A fellow by the name of Alex Patton, who's the number cruncher and the brilliant mathematician supplied me with those numbers. Uh, you can now uh, pay 40 bucks to Alex and he'll sell it to you directly on the internet. Um, and so um, that book, I believe I wrote that book four or five years in a row, 1990, 91, 92, 93, 94. By 95 already, the internet came into play. So for instance, the, 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 the vaunted baseball encyclopedia of which I have about 12 different copies of, big fat book no longer exists because you can get all that information now on the internet. And that's kind of what happened to how, my how to win at rotisserie baseball. People can get the information now on the computers. Well, you had those re-releases because the league was changing, rules were changing. Have you seen any changes as of late that you really gear your draft for uh, these past couple of seasons? Uh, the only problem that we are having is in the wins category because <laughs> the managers of the major leagues teams don't really care about us. So they'll pull a pitcher after four and two thirds innings, which makes us all absolutely bonkers. Yeah. You know, so your starter doesn't get the win. So if, if you're hunting for wins, you better find teams with managers who leave the guy in for five innings before pulling him. So that's, that's part of it. The other part of it, of course, is that now with the launch angles and all the rest of this nonsense, if you're trying to get a good batting average for your team, uh, good luck. Good luck. Yeah. Well, and a, a big change that we spent some time talking about was the National League adopting uh, the DH, a designated hitter. Did as, you see as any should, drastic changes in your draft? Yeah, as they should have. They should have done it a long time ago. Nobody wants to watch a pitcher hit or a pitcher <laughs> try to bunt or 
you know, hit, hit 100. Plus you've got all these wonderful players who are at an age where they no longer can field the way they used to. So the 22 and 23 year olds take their position. And now in the national league, you, you've got these guys who can DH. We had an interview with the commissioner that has a very competitive league. And he talked about, he wants players that play in certain ballparks. Uh, do you give that any credence? Or are you all about the talent of the player? I'm about, I'm all about the value of the player. So it's like, it's like the stock market. You don't want to pay $30 for a player who ends up giving you $17 worth of value. <clears throat> so you have to make certain decisions. Are you going to pay 30 bucks for a pitcher? Now, some people do. I've done it before. Um, <clears throat> Chris Sale, I pay 30 bucks for. But what happens too often you pay, you know, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think the, the, the Yankee pitcher I paid $27 for and in his third start hurt his arm and was through for the season. season. <clears throat> David Cohn, in fact, is who it was. And uh, you're cooked. Yeah. So, so part of my strategy is I will pay the full price for the hitters because unless, you know, something terribly goes wrong, where he slides and breaks his leg or something like that, the hitters will probably be worth something around what you paid for them. But the pitchers, that's always been a problem. You know, what do you pay for a guy? Is he going to get hurt? And today, I mean, I'm in Tampa Bay. I live in mm -hmm. St. Petersburg. Eight of the pitchers of the Tampa Bay Rays are on the DL. Eight of them. Ooh, Ooh is right. Who is right? So um, that's still a struggle. And, and we have to uh, pitch 1,100 innings. If you mm. don't get 1,100 innings under your belt, you're penalized, you know, <laughs> bigly. Uh, so, so it's not easy. You talked about how managers will pull their starter. I mean, we just saw with Kershaw working on a perfect game, and he gets pulled at 80 pitches in. Um, it's, it's disgusting. I think that... It's disgusting. And yet <laughs> the argument on the other side is, is that the manager's got to really got to baby his arm and make sure he doesn't get hurt and so forth and so <laughs> on. But for crying out loud, Robin Roberts would throw 250 pitches in a game. You know, it's <laughs> Amen. Like, <come> Amen. <laughs> so, so does that affect your draft? Do you uh, pick up more middle relievers? Cause that was a focus on a discussion we had last week. Well, the problem with picking up middle relievers, as I said, you've got to get 1,100 innings in. Right. You pick up a bunch of middle relievers. See, what happened one year, uh, you know, there are four categories, wins, ratio, saves, and innings. Uh, and, and no, win. It, it's not innings, but it's, it's wins, saves, ratio, and ERA. ERA is the third one, <clears throat> but the rule is the rule back then there was no, no maximum on the number of innings you had to pitch. So Alex Patton, the genius that he is picked nine relievers. It didn't matter. You didn't have to get, you know, so, so his relievers got a tremendous number of uh, saves, a decent number of wins. He was lowest in ERA. He was lowest in ratio. And, and by the time he was done, his pitchers probably pitched 250 innings. <laughs> and so the outrage was just huge. You know, it's like, we're not allowing that to happen. And so the next year we passed this rule that you had to pitch uh, 1,100 innings. Your pitchers had to pitch 1,100 innings or you would be penalized, you know, significantly. So that stopped, you know, the Alex Patton use all the relievers plan. And the evolution, yeah, the evolution of fantasy baseball. Right. And what's interesting is that with those books, How to Win at Rotisserie Baseball, a lot of the leagues that started up used our rules. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the leagues in this country use the rules that I put in those books. You touched on launch angle and the, the approach batters take uh, nowadays, a lot of them anyhow. And 
low averages, batting averages. Would there be any one thing that you would tell somebody that's starting to get into rotisserie baseball, fantasy baseball, maybe that would have changed from those early 90s? You know, I, I still I still maintain that the most important thing you can go you can do is to get pricing what these players ought to be worth in the coming years. If you don't have that, you're sunk. You're absolutely sunk. I mean, you can guess, but chances are you're going to end up finishing ninth or tenth if you don't know the prices. So um, you go to Alex Patton's pricing. And he figures in all of that. He knows which pitchers are going to not get the wins. And he'll tell you how many wins he believes your pitcher is going to get, the one you pick. Uh, of course, what he can't do is predict whether the pitcher is going to get hurt. And that's the hardest part. You pick a bunch of pitchers and they all end up on the DL. <laughs> You're in big trouble. Tough sledding. Well, so that's one of my favorite books of yours, How to Win in Rotisserie Baseball. Let's go back to one of your new releases, Valentine's Way. Of course, talking about Bobby Valentine. You spent a lot of time in New York. I got to imagine uh, you spent a lot of time with Bobby as well. Well, Bobby's from Stamford, Connecticut, and I'm from Stamford, Connecticut. And when he was in the ninth grade, I went to see Ripawam play in a baseball game. And this ninth grader was playing shortstop for Ripalom High School. Now, you don't ever see that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's rare enough when a 10th grader plays for a high school as big as Ripalom. And this kid was spectacular, absolutely spectacular. And the next year, I went to see Stanford High School play Ripalom High School in a football game. Uh, my mother was a French and Spanish teacher at Stanford High School. Bobby Valentine scored six touchdowns for Ripawam that day. Wow. He's the only All-State player. He was All-State as a sophomore, a junior, and a senior. He was probably the greatest athlete uh, ever to come out of the state of Connecticut. And so what happened was I had a Facebook friend who lived in Italy. And we were, we were on Skype together. And I sort of asked him, you know, do you have any baseball friends? And, and he said he did. He, he, he mentioned the, the former catcher for the, uh, for the Dodgers and Mets, Piazza. And he said he was very close with Bobby Valentine. So, so I said to him, you know, can I have Bobby's telephone number? And he said, sure. And I called Valentine and I said, uh, you know, Bobby, you know, I've been a fan of yours for a long time. How about we write a book together? And he thought about it and he said, okay. And that's kind of how it happened. And we talked on the phone for about 40 hours. He was one of the great, great authors, you know, who I ever worked with. He had a tremendous sense of humor. Uh, his ability to remember things was just awesome. Um, and he got in a lot of trouble, yeah. which is a lot of fun. <laughs> a lot of fun to write about. Um, and, uh, it's just, it was just so much fun. And the book is really, really terrific. And it's slowly beginning to gain steam. The publisher for reasons I never could I understand brought it out in November, oh. which is, you know, I, I guess they thought they were going to get Christmas sales, but you know, baseball was on strike back then. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's taken a while, but the thing is slowly beginning to to be noticed no, I, I can't wait to get my hands on it i always remember how animated he was on the sideline coaching for the mets all those years absolutely uh, so i gotta imagine there's a lot of good stories there there are there are there's a good story on every page you know <laughs> the fights he got in with managers um you know he loved 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 tommy lasorda so he's playing for Ogden, Utah, playing for Tommy Lasorda. And Lasorda says to him and Pechorek and a couple of the other guys, I want you to write a letter to the Dodger starter of your position and tell that guy why you're going to take his job. 
Wow. If you can imagine. And these are, you know, 19, 20 year old kids and they do what the manager says. Everyone, everyone did it except uh, the Dodger first baseman for 10 years. Uh, tell me his name. Um, mm. <laughs> he wouldn't do it. I'll think of it in the next 20 minutes. He wouldn't do it. He just wouldn't do it. And so when all of these players ended up coming up to the Dodgers, um, the Dodger manager who was there for all those years hated him, hated mm. Bobby, hated Pachorik, hated those guys. Um, Walter Alston was his name. There we and go. Walter treated Bobby terribly. In fact, Walter would call him Billy, Billy Alston, uh, Billy Alston, Billy, Billy Valentine, yeah. just to piss him off. He was so <laughs> upset that they had written these letters that none of these players, Billy Buckner was another one. Buckner ended up going to the Cubs mm -hmm. and of course later to the Red Sox. Um, but the stories, the stories are just marvelous. He had, he had a magical career. He was in Japan for seven or eight years. They loved him. When he left Japan, 100,000 people signed a petition asking him to stay. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So all that and more on its way out. Whispers of the Gods, your other uh, new release that folks are going to have to go check out. Peter, I can't thank you enough for talking with us here and, of course, going over some strategy on how to win at fantasy baseball. I need all the help I can get. Yeah, we all do. It's uh, <laughs> it's it's. It, Nobody wants to admit it, but there's probably about 80% of it is luck. You know, whether a guy gets hurt or doesn't get hurt, a guy comes out of nowhere to lead the league in hitting. Um, would you have guessed that Guriel would have led the league in hitting? No. I don't know. It's, 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 it's a magical game. It's just incredibly difficult to win. Well, Peter, I can't thank you enough. Uh, and I can't wait to catch up with you on down the road. This was really good stuff here today. I look forward to it. Thanks very much, Andy.